Ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin shortly, kindly please be seated and kindly please turn off your phone or change it to a silent mode. And uh, kindly please reduce your movement of getting in and out of the hall to avoid interference during the ceremony. Thank you for your cooperation and attention. Good morning to Dr. Kenneth Simler, the Senior Economist in the World Bank's Poverty and Equity Global Practice. Dr. Suraya Ismail, Director of Research, Kazana Research Institute. Architect Rida Abdul Razak from Citizens Lab, Sejam Berhad. Ms. Natalie Tan Sun Ling, Head of Transformational Enterprises, Dignity for Children. Ms. Rebecca Kavita, the Head of Welfare and Community Development, Dignity and Children. Welcome to the special session three, Urban Poverty and Cities for All. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is our privilege and great honor to call upon Dr. Azmi. We would like to invite all the speakers upstage, please. Please be invited. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is our privilege and great honor to call upon our moderator, uh, to call upon uh, Town Planner Norliza Hashim, CEO of Urbanist Malaysia, to deliver her opening remarks. Please be invited. Uh, thank you, Leah. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome all the panelists, you know, a lot of uh, familiar faces, but also a lot of young faces. So I think when we wanted to introduce this uh, subject on urban poverty, um, as we all know, uh, the poverty is not only, we used to think about poverty as of in rural areas. That's always the phenomena. And because of that, I think when we talk about budget, we talk about emphasis on gaps, it's always been in the rural areas. But with more people living in cities, I think urban poverty is becoming uh, a more uh, important issue in urban areas, but not spoken of much. It's like uh, like a hidden kind of uh, issue, you know. Uh, and you know, even when UNICEF came out uh, with a study to say that there are children who only eat have one meal a day, it was not well received. Eh? Uh, by Malaysians or decision makers. So I think uh, this discussion on urban poverty should be more, we should be more open about it to try to understand, but not so much from the perspective of uh, just the issue, but how do we really uh, you know, overcome it? Uh, and where urbanists always uh, try to look at uh, all these urban issues, we, we of course, we try to relate to the policies and legislation if there, there is an, a need to do that. But knowing Malaysia, we have all that policies in place already. I always feel that um, while waiting for the policies to be in place, what else can be done? The quick wins, you know? What could be done to actually overcome? And a lot of this, uh, a lot of effort now is being done on food to table, for example. And yesterday, also uh, on uh, urban resilience, we listened a lot on on food security. You know, uh, I think there's there's a lot of effort now on the ground uh, to do that. But what other things eh, that that we do? So I know that people on stage here, um, you know, uh, some of you have done uh, some of this work in these areas, and that's what we are hoping that you can share with our uh, audience. And this is also going live, so we really hope people online uh, is also sharing their views. And this is a subject matter that probably is also new for urbanists to pick up, uh, but we want it to be a start of the discussion. So before this, probably the emphasis is only on housing, on facilities, 
but the crux of it is actually the urban poverty. So if we really want to create a city that is for everyone, I think um, how do we make life more equitable and how do we provide opportunity really for everyone? And I think it's easy to say, but it's actually very difficult to do. And um, this is where a more collaborative effort is, is needed. So thank you very much to the panelists, first and foremost. And thank you to all that's in the room who have woken up very early to be here. Because knowing the traffic in, in KL, coming to this place is not that easy. So I really am looking forward to listen to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Noliza. And uh, we would like to invite Dr. Azmi Zamad Rashid, the Deputy CEO of Urbanist Malaysia, to moderate. The floor you is yours, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, you are now unmuted. Actually, this session will be moderated uh, by Dr. Sri Jose, but he's on uh, maybe quite a bit late because of the traffic jam. And then I start first. Let me introduce our, actually online now is Dr. Kenin Miller is a senior economist, World Bank, Poverty and Equity Global Practice. He's based in New York, Washington. I hope he's listened. Uh, he's just online now. And uh, Mr. Keynes is a senior economist at the World Bank. He's has experienced more than 30 years. His work is focused on policy to reduce poverty and equality. And uh, he's carrying South apply uh, microeconomic research and analysis on distribute impact of public policy on people well-being. Uh, the second uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Suraya Ismail. She's a director of Research Hazana Research Institute, Dr. Suraya. Before he joins Institute, he's a program director of Think Cities and uh, is a deputy dean, prior to that, he's a deputy dean of Faculty of Built Environment, UST Malaya. He's, um, he's worked um, more on um, research on uh, affordable house and recently he has research on urban poverty. You are now muted. And uh, the second is Mr. Reda Raza. He's uh, from Citizens, uh, Citizens Sri Amrahat. He's lots of do lots of um, projects. Now I heard that he's doing on uh, how young people start a business eh, in somewhere in PJ. And we have also Nedlin Tanku Sumli. You are now unmuted. He's a head of transformative uh, enterprise dignity for children. Netly Grow um, is a wanted to be a teacher. He is a lit degree in English literature and education at a Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. And he joined Dignity 2014, a part of project uh, education innovation team uh, at the CEO office. Actually, the Dignity office is uh, if we familiar with the Project B in Sentul, this he is the one. Have been in uh, Dignity Project. Uh, Project B had been one of our technical visit for World Open Forum Nine. And uh, he's anchored the skill training education program, and he loves to teach and hard to build youth education model that bring joy back to learning. Uh, final final um, panelist is Rebecca. Is uh, a graduate uh, Bachelor of Science Medical Science International Medical University and he's anchored the medical due the uh, negligence for the medical program children child protection case management and community engagement program for refugees and stateless family registered in in the foundation is un under dignity uh, 20, 20, 2014 Without further ado, we'd like to invite, maybe uh, we'd like to hear from Ken Washington. Hello, Ken. Are you there? Are you listening to us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very okay, much. Thank uh, you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm listening to you. Now, um, can we start? Uh, we'd like to invite you to speak about yourself and what your program for the property that you have been done so far. 
Uh, sure. Um, I mean, most of our, our work has been on um, the, 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 the World Bank in Malaysia is a, is a knowledge and, and research hub. So a lot of wor our work has been focused on on that. But I, I think kind of to open, to kind of frame some remarks, I want to just bring up a couple of things, especially coming off uh, Juan Norliza's opening comments as far as urban poverty being, being overlooked. I want to say something that might be a surprise to some of you there. Um, before I do that, I want to Say hi to everyone. I wish I were there with you in person. Um, a, a very good morning to all of you. Um, now, everyone knows that in Malaysia, as in most countries, the poverty rate, the incidence of poverty, is higher in rural areas than it is in urban areas. The 2019 um, Household Income and, uh, Income and Expenditure Survey that was announced back in July showed that the poverty rate was 12.4% in rural areas and 3.8% uh, in urban areas. But what I think most people don't know is that according to those same statistics from the Household Income and Expenditure Survey, there are more poor Malaysians in urban areas than there are in rural areas. 54% of poor households live in urban areas in Malaysia. This is something that's switched. Since 2016, the urban rural was the same in terms of the numbers of poor people. But because 75% of the Malaysian population is urban, uh, even though it has a lower rate, there's actually a higher number of poor people and poor households in urban areas. Um, often we hear, when people talk about poverty in Malaysia, um, you hear about pockets of poverty in the more remote areas. And I believe, and, and the data show, this is a mischaracterization. For example, there are more people living in poverty in urban Selangor than there are poor people in all of Terengganu State or in all of Pahang State. And even urban Johor has even more poor people than urban selling. So we need to look at poverty in those lines. So as far as what we're doing, one of the things we're doing is trying to uncover from the, from the data, from the surveys, from the other work, what the real characterization of poverty is. And just to, one of the things that comes out of that is, and this I think shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, is that we need to tackle urban poverty holistically and to address the causes. And that means getting at the nexus of employment, affordable housing, and transportation among others. Thanks, and I'll pass it to my, to my other panelists now. I hope that at least partly answered your question. Thank you, Ken. Uh, actually, the recently, uh, Department of Statistics Malaysia announced a revision of national poverty lines income uh, from 980 ringgit to 2,208. Uh, however, the PLI uh, doesn't take account of cost of living beyond the basic budget. I think uh, maybe Dr. Suraya want to say something about uh, your current research on uh, urban poverty. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asmizam. Hello. Morning, and, and thank you, Bernice, for inviting Kazana Research Institute um, to give some of our views on this very delicate and important matter. I'm glad that Ken, hello Ken, um, has uh, opened up the, the, the issue of poverty um, by giving us the terrain of how it emerges. Um, and now it is true that it's more in a urban sector, urban rather than more, they're still in rural, but the, the people who are poor are more in urban sector. Uh, Ken mentioned that, and also Dr. Asmizam, that the uh, poverty rate uh, has been increased, and now there are nearly five million, sorry, 500,000 households that are in poverty. However, um, we also did some study at a macro level, then I'll, I'll zoom into the, a bit on the micro level later, uh, what we've done at uh, social housing. But more at the gen uh, macro level, yes, there are those who are in that line, below that line, but what is the line, right? So let's look at what are the people that might uh, fall into that line as well if there were some economic shocks. So we did some simulation and we found out that a certain shock of 700 RM a year would then uh, put about a higher percentage of household into the poverty bracket. And that's about 1.2 million household. And these are all people of course, um, in most of it, most of it, because economic shocks is about cost of living. And you know cost of living is higher in urban, urban sphere. 
And therefore, if these economic shocks were to happen, it, it, it will be, uh, include more urban people in. So that's about 1.2 million households. Um, so this is something that we really need to understand. Why is this happening? What, what is it that, that can't make our, um, no, no, what is it that could um, alleviate the standard of living of those in the, what we call the vulnerable group? How, what can we do? So, um, and in order to do that, we can't be looking at um, that the macro level. We must look at, as uh, rightly Ken mentioned just now, at the enclaves of poverty and how a city can have an ecosystem. Um, here I'm referring to Oldenburg's first, second, and third uh, places, places of recreational, places for uh, buying their uh, groceries, as well as shelter, in order to make uh, them at least experience a decent lifestyle and a decent life. Currently, we're very lucky because public health and education is free. They are accessible to all these clinics are to Malaysia. However, um, some of the things that we ought to be looking at is the operating environment of the poor and how best do we create a positive operating environment before we actually look at the income. I, th I think that's the first uh, point I want to bring in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suraya. Uh, actually, um, urban poverty is one of the major interesting sub research subject uh, due to the impact of the urbanizations and in any developing country. Uh, we listen from the Cairns and Suraya. Maybe uh, Dr. Suraya wants to say something about your project on urban poverty. Okay, thank you, Dr. Azmizam. Thank you, Urbanist, for giving me the chance. This is the third year in a row <laughs> from um, Move and move and this yeah. So uh, should I open the slides? Yeah, can you open the slides? Yeah. All right. So basically, uh, we from Citizens Lab. Uh, this uh, we'll be sharing about our quest in uh, reducing urban poverty and creating other uh, cities for all. So we'll introduce the next slide, please. Yeah, so a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we are a group of young professionals, architects, lawyers, doctors, planners, and a lot of uh, other professionals from the media and tech line. So we group together to create uh, change makers and create platform for the youth. So, I mean, poverty is one of the line that we are looking at next. Uh, what we do is actually we create community empowerment platforms, uh, mainly in uh, hubs, community hubs, and also through software, software system, web systems, and then also creative engagement fram framework with local governments and federal governments, and also uh, state government as well. And also we, we, do, we do a lot of community capacity building for the public, yeah? Next. Uh, our approach is basically, we use the nested approach, where we always look at the not only top bottom, but bottom up, but the combination of both, which is we, we actually engage with both parties and we place ourselves as the in the middle, which is the integration to localize and communication. This is very important because not many people are actually sitting in the center of the hierarchy of the whole ecosystem. So this is very important because we need to connect things together. Yeah. Next. All right. Uh, today I'm supposed to talk about urban poverty. So we do a lot of research on SDGs, especially and new urban agenda. Uh, we look at into uh, New Bajina in terms of the whole document and uh, how it relates, correlate, and uh, the word urban poverty not really appear a lot in New Bajina, but the word affordability appears a lot in the New Urban Agenda. So if you plot out the whole New Urban Agenda, you can look at a lot of issues that has been highlighted, highlighted there. But uh, for research, uh, the main key uh, issues is uh, personal insecurity from the person financial security, tenure insecurity, education, health poverty, social insecurity, identity crisis that leads to livelihood issues. So I, uh, Dr. Surat rightly put some of this data has been put out about uh, minimum wage, uh, wages that is suitable in KL, uh, affordable homes, and then uh, also the kids bottom malnutrition, yeah? Uh, we work together with a lot of local governments like uh, DBKL, MBBJ, and many. Uh, to create a lot of frameworks like this and how to actually create more platform creations 
for the community at the same time work together with the local governments uh, looking to a resilient uh, resiliency uh, community awards programs uh, especially community hub which we feel that uh, it's very important to have a physical appearance uh, rather than only digital and then we do a lot of digital fabrications and also uh, one of the other things is actually to think about how to cr create more change makers uh, community champions around the city once you have more community champions you have more of this kind of initiative uh, but today I'll be sharing about the community hubs what we do uh, I was we always have this idea that when we have community hubs place equals people over space that must have a purpose so our purpose is actually very clear we want to create as many platforms as possible for the youth and for our future to so uh, currently we are running two uh, community hubs which is one is Rumah Tangsi Heritage Community Platform in collaboration with uh, DBKL. This one is um, thanks to uh, Jabatan Pelaksana for renovating uh, Ms. No uh, Puan Nur Zaini and the team. Uh, we managed to discuss with DBKL to turn this into a community hub. And the other one is uh, a three, three weeks year old program. What we are doing now is a uh, Raf Klanajaya, which is a food hub platform for, for local entrepreneurs. So I will share you the pictures. Eh? So a little bit about uh, Rumah Tangsi. Uh, this is our um, pillars. Uh, Rumah Tangsi is a sustainable heritage space making community hub designs as a platform. We engage, we innovate and sharing economy spaces. So our pillars is actually looking to heritage modernization, cultural lifestyle, local promotion in response to collaborating with tourism and entertainment. We do a lot of collaboration with tourist uh, guides as well. Uh, of course, when we do this, we have a framework. So this is our framework. Uh, I wish to thank DBKL for actually always being open in terms of collaborations. We collaborate with DBKL and all its departments and also uh, creating a hybrid placemaking which combined between physical and digital. Uh, that's relating to all the other stakeholders. Uh. Uh, these are some of the collaborators that we work. We are only one year old, but we have actually uh, collaborated with so many organizations from uh, uh, PASA Seloka, Air Asia, M Malaysia Airlines, OB, Mission Universities, a lot. In one year, we've done, uh, achieved a lot. And uh, we support uh, artists. Uh, so. All these, artists, all these artists also have actually supported us. Datuk Siti Nohaliza, Awi, The Fam, and then uh, Nora Danish, Mira Filza. They were always coming around. Even last week, I was at the, at the uh, place. Uh, we were discussing with Dayana Faiza in terms of how to do program and Awi Rafael. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting programs that we helped the B40 is actually the Pink Tank Art Exhibition last year. So what we did was actually we, we discussed with a lot of street artists in terms of how to do collaborations. Uh, they don't have a lot of money, uh, probably no money, uh, but uh, we actually do a lot of uh, sharing, uh, business sharing models. Um, not money, monetary, but uh, digital assets and then knowledge sharing and also, uh, you know, uh, a lot of other things, program sharing. So the recent one last month was MyCV, Micro Interventions VAP uh, competition uh, with the arts and craft company. We do a lot of community uh, uh, program with entrepreneurs, uh, collaboration with Pasar Apri Love, uh, Pasar Seluka, uh, next one is we in January we're gonna do with Rio. Uh, other programs: collaboration, fashion, entrepreneurs, uh, Scafea, uh, Jana Yo. Uh, next two weeks we're gonna do with Kelly Fashion Week Digital. So that's gonna be exciting, yeah. Uh, apart from that, we do yoga through business sharing models. So we sit a lot with the yoga entrepreneurs and the health uh, exercise uh, business. So we do sharing models. So they come, they actually bid for the space, uh, share the space. And then after that, uh, you know, another yoga and other activities, yeah. This, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, a lot of uh, people exposed these days. Uh, during MCO, we were uh, collaborating with a lot of uh, social enterprise, doing uh, video competitions. Uh, so we actually contribute grants also, to uh, micro grants to others, and also a drawing competition with Cosine Tricks, uh, ARN, and also Toy Library. Uh, this was a very interesting program. I think the speaker after this, uh, YB, is coming. Uh, we did a collaboration with YB for me. Uh, we this is a grant given by MARI, uh, Malaysia Reform I Initiative, uh, US Embassy. Uh, it's actually a workshop for local artists, uh, hip hoppers. So they are supposed to discuss and learn about democratic reformation. And then from there, they are supposed to do lyrics and they perform at the concert that we, uh, we did at the place. This is a very interesting program. About 40 artists from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning. So we wish to do it again if possible if we get the grant next year but probably theater this time, yeah. Uh, during the MCO, uh, I've talked to this uh, Caterpillar, which is my friends. Uh, they do hydroponic 
So they were talking to me, uh, they're doing a lot of the hydroponic on the, uh, the, the balcony. So I said, okay, let's connect this to Lala Move. And then they actually uh, had this uh, campaign about one house, one uh, hydroponic. They call it the proof. And then uh, what they did is actually, after that, we called them to actually do a workshop uh, for kids. So we did a collaboration with Alice, Alison Smith Schools. So now uh, we are continuing next year probably uh, to do more schools uh, programs with uh, young kids. Uh, they, when you say kids, it's between the age of five to uh, eight years old. So a lot of the kids come, come over and learn how to do this hydroponic from the start to the end. Uh, also about urban poverty. Okay, this is the only page probably I'll find about urban poverty in the whole of New Banjana under NUA 123. So it talks about promotion in terms of integration of food security, all those things, one to nine. But we focus on integration of food security, nutritional needs for urban residents, marketing for food consumers, and reduce the use of uh, hazardous chemicals. So from that idea of working together with Poof, we actually continued the idea of working with Poof in another of our project three weeks ago. We, in the, during MCO, we were busy doing this, uh, opening a new, because we, we saw that during MCO, there's this clear div uh, divide between essential service and non-essential service. Non-essential service have all the money, essential service was suffering. So we thought that how do we actually uh, connect this non-essential service to the essential service? Because a lot of my friends were retrenched from the pilots, from the uh, ho uh, hospitality, from the movies and uh, multimedia industry outlets and all. So we created this place called RAF in Tranjaya. You are all welcome to come. So what it is, is a food hub collaboration between Times Local Strength. We sit down with the Tranjaya uh, entrepreneurs and then it's a cultural promotion and also uh, economic revivals. Um, it's a concept where we, we combine with another restaurant. So we, we give empowerment to the local. Even uh, during the open call, we had a lot of 50 stalls come. So we curated 50% is uh, uh, established brands, but the 50% we give to local entrepreneurs around which has been retrenched. You'll be surprised that some of them are, are pilots, and some of them are in the, ho in the hotels industry. And then, uh, yeah. So these are some of the collaborations with the local food. Uh, we have the Sago Pop, uh, Sago Pop. Uh, Kuwait Tiao, they actually do, uh, continued from Lawan to create their own brand, Pak Daud, Kuwait Tiao. And then uh, we found in uh, some of, we found in Kayu Ara, the Sate Baraka, a special, very young entrepreneur. And then Gorpus, uh, Social Dab, and many more. Yeah? Uh, some of the local products the youth are uh, making. So these are people who are retrenched. They are professionals, but they don't have work now. Yeah? So these are the things that they are actually creating now. Uh, new program now, since we are having this, so we are opening up more economical platforms for youth uh, to become our ra uh, route runner. So uh, similar to uh, yeah, Grab, you know, but uh, they are sending all these foods and this create more job opportunities. So we believe that even even you don't have job, you have to find a job. But even you have job, it's still not enough because you need to create multiple income stream to be uh, to survive. Yeah. Uh, overall, our target is partnership with the local community support the youth, economic revival, promote urban farming, and then promote local culture. We also have this wall of urban farming there so that the public can actually learn about urban farming and also uh, learn about hydro farming, farming. Our future projects is about training local tourist guides in heritage tourism, uh, lightweight drones, because this is uh, very crucial in the future, web seminar using green skins for webinars, uh, competition with local champion on uh, project mapping uh, with uh, motion picture, Project promote extreme sports culture through movies. We're doing our first movie next year. And, and then also the most exciting part, a lot of people waiting is barbecue fest with local players. We are sitting with a lot of the barbecue players uh, to do a barbecue fest next year. I hope we can do it. Eh? <laughs> our future hope is that to create the next level of placemaking, which is the sports, community sports hub. Uh, as we all know, uh, soccer is uh, very, uh, uh, a lot of people like to do it now. In fact, one of the, speakers in the U.S. Assembly now runs a sports hub uh, in uh, Cabo Baru. So that this is the, our hope in the future to actually work with local government to uplift their uh, open, open space. Uh, five points before I end is uh, to the B40 and M40 is to learn to work with others and collaborate. This is more important. And then have empathy. That's the most important empathy. Sincere, don't assume, help others. Be innovative, adaptive, and creative in the normal. Continue to learn and learn from others. And also the main thing is mindset to create platform for others and sharing economy and, uh, you know, uh, help others all the time. All right. With that, thank you. Let's build together better, yeah?
Thank you, Reda. That amazing work that you've done. And um, to achieve sustainable number two or three, I think uh, what Reda has shown here is more on the poverty, how to educate these uh, poverty issues, and you manage to get some project to leverage the the community to better better living. Then that's why I think the partnership is is very important to achieve how to uh, to reduce the poverty in urban area. Maybe I want to listen more from uh, dignity. May maybe Natalie want to share something because we heard about dignity. A project for the B for B project B, uh, maybe is uh, you can want you want to share with us. Um, on slides as well, if you're clever enough. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor, and uh, to all the other members of the panel. Uh, my name is Natalie Pan. I work as the head of uh, transformational enterprises at Dignity for Children Foundation. Um, we've been in uh, Sentul Care for the last 22 years. Um, working with uh, B40 communities through education. So um, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to take you on a quick journey of how we started. Uh, we don't come so much from a perspective of um, academia, but um, working directly with the urban poor. So fine, thanks. So I um, just want to share quickly how we started. 22 years ago, our founder, Petrina, she's from, she's from Kelantan actually. So she, she grew up in a more rural area. She had come to KL and she took a wrong turn into the Sentul neighborhood because uh, she didn't know the roads well. Um, and she would find out later that Sentul was and still is the poorest constituent in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, she saw these two children by the side of the road and they were just dragging heavy buckets of water. So she was so confused, she stopped and she got out of her car and she asked, where are you going and why are you carrying buckets of water at the tepi jalan? And they explained that there was no water at home, so they had to fill buckets from a tap outside and bring it home. Upon further discovery, it seemed their house not only had no water, had no food, no electricity, but they had eight mouths to feed. The father was a drug addict. The mother had no job. She was a housewife. And not too far away, you can see the beautiful twin towers in the background and the KL skyline. And, and she thought, you know, uh, Petrina thought, is it possible for Malaysians to live in such poverty when we have the tallest buildings in the world and all these facilities? Yes, it's possible for urban poverty back then, and it still is. So they started um, this education initiative called Dignity, um, working with street children and volunteers just trying to meet the needs. Um, but all these children started showing up, uh, members of the urban poor community, not just PPR children, but uh, migrant children, refugee children, children with no IC, no nationality. And uh, they, they started coming. Um, 20 years ago, nobody had heard of refugee children. You know, um, That wasn't something we talked about. Um, so poverty had many faces. It included uh, hunger, learning delay, broken families, small, small homes, uh, poor nutrition, job instability, all these things which were mentioned earlier. And all just making it really hard for children to stay in school. Um, so we started you know, with this, this goal that education would be the only key to be able to break the cycle of poverty. So we started the learning center and from, from that day, um, it has mushroomed 22 years later, we have about 1,800 children enrolling annually. 80% um, of them are from, 90% uh, of them are from the B40 community, 80% of them have no access to public schooling and a lot of other facilities. So we started on three fundamental beliefs that number one, the poor in our society, they are not a burden to us. They're actually a resource. They're actually an asset. They don't need handouts. They need support to be contributing citizens. The second is all children have the right to receive education and a safe space to play. I think you were mentioning just now um, about safe spaces right, for youth to be so important regardless of their nationality or legal status. And the third thing we believe is that the poor don't deserve our leftover. The poor deserve the best that we have. Because honestly, if the poor is able to lift our poverty, the whole nation will benefit. So these are some of the programs we run that are designed to meet the needs of the whole child. Not just education, but many other things. Uh, we run English medium education for preschool and primary using the Montessori philosophy. So this is just some of the methods we use to teach our children uh, English. We bring them for field trips. We take them out. We make sure that the learning environment is beautiful and inspiring. At secondary, uh, we were the first center, 
I believe, to start uh, preparing students for uh, English medium uh, uh, Cambridge syllabus. And we also incorporate vocational training, entrepreneurship training, internship with the final goal to making them uh, contributing citizens. So this is just some pictures. Yeah. We do run skills training as well. Um, we have about 13 different types of skills training, right, ranging from uh, urban gardening, hair cutting, sewing, F&B, graphic design. I think nowadays is coding is the trend. So all kinds of uh, different things. And uh, we also include character development, social emotional well-being, just helping them to be the best that they can be. You see, these are uh, examples of uh, dignity. We run transformational enterprises. Uh, these are small businesses which are training platforms for the youth to really learn the skill and interact with the community. Um, which if you come to Sento, you will be able to walk in at any point. We have a cafe, sewing studio, a hair salon, art studio, a bakery. And uh, they've been running for the past five years and have trained uh, hundreds of, of youth. But we realize that education is not enough, right? You know, you can't keep a child in school when they are facing so many barriers in, in, in life. So we also provide food provision. We do have children who come with one meal a day. They have no food, means they will fall asleep <laughs> while you're trying to teach. So food provision, transportation. We have children come as far as Ramban, Rawang, because they have no access to education. They are willing to get on a bus and ride for two, three hours to just to get education. Uh, we provide a lot of uh, mental health and social emo emotional development through workshops. We have a dedicated wellness department because we realize that poverty is not just physical, it's not just emotional. There's a lot of mental health aspect that goes uh, unnoticed behind, uh, behind the surface. So we want to address that. We do health and dental screenings. We also reach out to the community through food aid drives and running programs with the families of targeted communities that are most at risk. And a lot of them are in our back door in KL. We bring sports to the children. We realize it's such a powerful tool to teach peace education. If you've ever seen a, a six-year-old girl fiercely play football, it's a really, really empowering sight, you know? So, um, yeah, we, we bring sports to them. We also do teachers' training. We run grassroots educator training. We've done it for over 1,000 teachers, not just in community learning centers in KL, but we've had people come from Philippines, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar. They want to learn how do you do quality education for the poor. Um, recently, we started working with our own Orang Asli, and it's been a really you know, amazing journey. Um, they're really amazing. So we have um, people coming in from Postanao and Slim River in Perak. Uh, in the last 22 years, we've seen this huge spike, you know, 1,800 children enrolled each year, like I mentioned, 90% from urban poor communities. And over the last 20 years, uh, about 12,000 children, most of whom, as I mentioned, they cannot access education in our system. Um, we've been really, really privileged to have uh, international recognition from other parts of the world, um, recognizing that the work we do is transformational. I think why it's uh, encouraging to us is because working with the poor is not, it's, it can be very, very difficult, it can be very, very draining, but it needs to be done, it must be done. So we, we continue doing what we do. Um, we do believe that when we have transformed lives, we see transformed communities, and then you can see the transformation of the city. So just want to end with a few quick uh, faces of children who have come to our doors. This is Lavanya. She came from a broken home in a PPR community, one of the first in her family to break out of the cycle of poverty. She's now training to be a nurse. Rahman, his family lived in a shipping container in Penang because they had nowhere to live. At age 10, he could not read or write or speak a word of English. He just finished his degree in business in Monash University last year. This is Rashida. Her family, her mother was married at age 14 years old. She could not read or write as well at 10 years old. Today, she um, finished education and she's an advocate for women's rights. Gosun, he was an orphan boy. He was abandoned by his father by the, by a rest, by an internet cafe. Uh, today, he is working as a chef in one of the top restaurants in KL. This is Sharifa. She was also from a refugee background. Last year, she was nominated for, one of the in, for an international award of Women of Courage by the U.S. State Department for her work uh, advocating for women's rights in the refugee community. And lastly, this is Vicky, one of the two children carrying the buckets of water. 
She finished her studies and today she is serving as a teacher, giving back to Orang Asli community as a teacher in Pahang. So I just really want to end with this saying that the really best anti-poverty program is a world-class education. And if we can invest in this education and make it accessible for all young children, we will be able to see you know, a solution to urban poverty, one of the solutions to urban poverty. Thank you. Wow, wow what an amazing job. Thank you. Really, um, really impressed us. Maybe um, Bika want to add something because you are the head of welfare and community development in Dignity for Children. You want to add something? Good morning to the distinguished guests and my fellow panelists. Um, it's so inspiring, right, to hear the stories of uh, different transformational efforts. So Dignity for Children has been very committed towards community development through education, quality education for the poor. Um, but what I think is very intrinsic to us is um, that we have a mental health and welfare unit, a child protection unit at Dignity because we saw how this component goes hand in hand with the transformation of children through education. And that is something intrinsic and unique to us. So we go down to the community, not just to educate. It doesn't just uh, end with educating the children. So some of the workshops we have is on personal safety, on emotional intelligence, growth mindset, love and belonging, how to sustain uh, healthy relationships because of the onslaught of media and how we have all these negative messages of what love is. You see a lot of the social problems also rising because of, um, because of these wrong messages being sent their way. So we counter that with the truth. We anchor them and ground them in, what, um, in, in sound knowledge on these different issues on love and belonging, personal safety. And this year we started an awareness on sexual grooming um, because we, we realized how child protection with the MCO, when we all went on lockdown, the children were on their phones. So we don't know how susceptible they were to um, the child predators. And so we quickly, as soon as MCO lifted, we did the child protection uh, workshops on sexual grooming awareness. Apart from that, we also go down to the parents because it doesn't just end with the children. If you mold the child of the you, you mold the mind of the child and you do not mold the mind of the parent, then your effort, your impact is actually limited because you did not tackle the main environment to which the child goes home. In dignity, they have catered such, we catered to such a world standard quality environment for them to learn. But when you go back, very often when the welfare team, um, there's about four to five of us, we go down to the ground to do home visits, we see, we're shocked by what we see because it's right in KL, right in the back door of Dignity and you would see families just, six families just cramped into one condominium unit, one apartment unit, one flat unit and you will not believe there'll be a family of six sharing a one small tiny room and that's, I was shocked as a welfare officer when I, when I saw these kids in such a loving environment in Dignity and I saw what they were going back to, I realized there was a gap to bridge. So we started workshops with the parents on family planning. If you're not, if you're not equipped to bring a child into the world, you know, we, we want to equip you, equip you with the right environment, financial literacy, positive parenting, um, and family planning, uh, initiatives before we to create the right environment to bring a child into it so we went down and taught the parents uh, these workshops the refugee and both the posse so, yeah. wow. very amazing work have you done both of you congratulations yes yeah, still continue huh? no <laughs> don't don't give up Co keep keep going <laughs> Okay, back to Dr. Sraya. Um, li by listening to these three amazing people, um, I can, can say about standard of living. Do you think that we need to rethink how we measure poverty? What do you think about that? You might want to ask Ken that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, this is very important. I, I, I love what has been done by uh, dignity and antigen. Um, you see, 
it's an all of um, it's not just all of government effort to um, to um, to fight poverty. Um, it's also all of community civil civil society parents, you know, people who are interested to help and give back to um, to the nation. Um, but the other thing that that, that I, I'll just be honest with with a few things that that we've seen so far. Um, <laughs> so, so we did uh, our study in uh, PPR. Uh, we interviewed uh, four thousand household in PPR. I went into a few houses, yes, um, and from the profile of the head of household uh, of the PPR, we found that most of the parents, both of them, work. Um, everybody works, um, and to say that that they are lazy, that's why they are poor, is just really bad. So I totally agree with the, the prejudices that we must elevate the prejudices of, of uh, <laughs> um, the prejudices that exist, that um, this is something that is they're poor, and therefore they, they shouldn't uh, be helped, sorry. But there's also the, the, the one thing here is that shel for shelter, for shelter, the positive living, positive living um, environment, um, one of the things about public policy is that uh, if the private sector will, uh, cannot give uh, a good standard or decent quality of housing, therefore the public sector, the government would produce all these um, shelter but from our study I think we might need a hybrid approach because some of the standards we found in PPR is not good so it it begs the question if you had intervened if the government had intervened to provide a better living condition um, this is not happening so so why did we intervene because another way of looking into um, uh, settlement or human settlement is that you have your kampongs or villages or kampong warisan in the city and you give them good amenities, uh, good infrastructure that would not break the social fabric. But once you start relocation and then you start putting people in uh, vertical, uh, very highly densified um, places, there are issues of maintenance, there's issue of density, there's issue of um, now, during COVID, um, most of them have to wait about an hour just to go up the lift because you can't go there more than five in one lift. So these are the issues that crop up in terms of positive living environment. If we can't give adequate housing condition to the poor, maybe it's good time for us to think about maybe housing vouchers, meaning for the poor, for those in the B20, not all, not B40, B20, it is, might be a good idea to put um, these families in apartments that are of decent quality with housing vouchers. So this is one of the, the things that we are looking at. And therefore you don't seclude or you don't just lump the poor together because as you know, um, in lumping uh, poor people together, it will create um, a few other things that, that um, I'll, I'll explain later. But one of the major issues of um, ensuring that uh, uh, the poor are being put within an integrated community is that they can then see, they can expect to have better amenities, better playground, and this is something that we would like to hope. And, and when you are near to each other, the proximity creates empathy. So, so this is something that we have to look at. Um, another feature that we found from the PPR studies is that 90% of respondent goes to Taman Layang Layang, public parks, believe it or not. They go to public parks for a recreational uh, time. They don't go to the malls. So, so this is another thing we have to think when we talk to planners um, and other private developers. Um, when we want to create an inclusive city, there must be more public and free access places. And parks is the best. Um, so I think we should stop building malls and start um, doing more things for recreational, for 
the, 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 the B40 and M40. Second thing is that uh, in terms of um, uh, transportation, um, it can be said from the um, from how much the poor is earning in P B in the PPR that the tra public transportation costs, our LRTs, MRTs, are a bit expensive. So if we are keen to help everybody, because I, I like what um, uh, the, the panelists said here, that um, if we give um, chances, or it's not chances, it's so condescending, sorry. The word that you used was good, uh, em quality um, empowerment. Um, people will um, uh, move up. Um, Far be it from an economist to say all this, because we t I think we need a sociologist. <laughs> but um, we always talk about engines of growth. And, and I think we have seven million households in, in Malaysia. It, in exist, it has the poor, it has the not so poor, it has the rich. If we can have in our mind seven million engines of growth, that would be fantastic. So, so all of us, all of this would then make a, you know, all of us think that we are all um, engines of growth, not just the rich, but also um, the most, uh, the ones who are not unfortunate, as who are unfortunate, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saya. Your statement, I <laughs> rewrite my uh, question to Ken. This is the question for Ken. Ken, you listen. To if a modernization really helps drive economy development, why do many global cities remain refilled with poor slum dwellers? Okay, that's that's a big question. Um, I mean, it's and I, I'll pick up from where, where Dr. Sarai left off as far as engines of growth. And you're right about the seven million you know households as being engines of growth. But one of the things that you know, Ed Glazer, a professor at Harvard, calls calls cities um, humankind's best invention ever because that is really Cities are the biggest engines of growth across the world. There's all kinds of great things that come out of people coming together. But where we have cities failing or parts of cities failing is because the cities become uh, divided. They become exclusive rather than inclusive. And you know some of it comes down to comes down. Excuse me. Some of that comes down to poor planning. Um, you have neighborhoods that are physically cut off by roadways, by transitways, by something else. And as as uh, as um, Rebecca from uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Natalie from Dignity was saying, you know, you've got these people in in Central who are looking at the towers, at the Petronas Towers, and thinking, how can these realities be in within a, a kilometer or two of each other? So, while I think you know, with all the I'm I'm humbled to be surrounded by you know you know these these uh, grassroots activists who are actually doing things. With people, and I'm kind of just I'm doing a you know, white collar job economic analysis. Um, I'm you know hats off to you completely, but a lot of it comes down to thinking of cities holistically and, and having cities work for the people who are there. Um, you know, I mentioned in my earlier intervention as far as the nexus of employment, affordable housing, and transportation because you have to you know, get out of poverty, you have to work somewhere, you always have to live somewhere. And you have to get somewhere between the two. And others readily brought up it's not just work and play, it's not just work and, and sleep and, and go between the two, it's also recreational activities. It's also services, whether it's shopping, whether it's education, whether it's health services. So you need to be connected. And um, in, in many cities, not just not in, in Malaysia, in, in, in the, very close to where I'm sitting right now in Washington, D.C. Um, cities are broken because uh, the dividing walls go up for one reason or another. It could be geographic, like I said, a, a highway that cuts a city into a poor area and richer area or railway tracks. It can be institutional, where people are marginalized because of um, because of their lack of education, because of their ethnic background, or for other reasons. And it really... Um, you know, the idea of, of housing vouchers and integrating mixed income neighborhoods, that's really important. And there's some great research by, by Raj Chetty and colleagues showing how, how that proximity to other people who are more advantaged 
can be a, a great um, benefit to people who are coming from more disadvantaged situations or just put in that situation where they can, uh, where they have uh, not only safe housing, but also some, um, they have their, their people who are their peers as human beings, but might not be their economic peers and something to look, something to, to look towards on that. Um, so a lot of it comes down to, I mean, I, I think, I think one of the things you hear a lot is, I mean, people talk about slum upgrading, you want to, want to upgrade slums and, and it comes to, you know, looking at the symptom rather than the, the causes. It's like, it's like you have a fever, so you put on an ice pack and you forget, you don't address why you have a fever. So you need to look at it um, in all these pieces. And it's, it's something that's hard for governments to do because you have different ministries handling transportation, handling housing, handling labor and employment. And then you also have the, the, the national and state and municipal, and municipal governments and getting all those parts to work together is difficult. But uh, usually it takes a um, combination of strong local leadership, and that's not just the, the DBKL, but that's within, within uh, neighborhoods. It also, it, it does require, um, you know, private sector intervention and also uh, um, interventions by people such as the panelists. We have my, my co-panelists here. So that's a long way around of not really fully answering your question because if I knew, all, if I had all the answers, um, that would be amazing, but I don't. Thank you, thank you, Kane. Uh, Dr. Uzi, Dr. Sri Uzi, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, this morning we talk about the standard of living. So one of the actions to deliver uh, the sustainable agenda is maybe we need to introduce the decent standard living to guide. You are now muted. Um, for all city li living in the city. One of the major problem is the income inequality. Recently, uh, Dawson uh, announced the revisions of uh, PLI from 980 to 2,208. Um, but some researchers, some people said the PLI uh, doesn't take into account of cost of living beyond the ba uh, very basic uh, budget. Um, is any uh, clue on that, uh, Dato Sri? Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, 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 with regard to the, the question uh, posted to me about uh, is it enough, uh, just looking at the uh, PLI as the measurement uh, of to see how uh, people, especially in the city, uh, to have the good, uh, decent uh, life or not, I think uh, PLI, PLI, there is the the objective for for the for the but for PLI to, to to determine how many that people are below certain uh, income uh, threshold, but uh, that uh, as the economists or you as the uh, people that look at uh, the the statistics as the whole for the country, we can see that uh, PLI uh, uh, is not really uh, can. Uh, explain uh, everything because in PLI it is not really cover uh, in terms of uh, cost of living. So I think the, uh, everyone know that uh, the cost of living in uh, one area compared to other area is very much different. Uh, depend on the uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, for example, certain certain places uh, the cost to to own a house, to rent uh, the house is much uh, uh, expensive uh, compared to others. And also it depends on the, the structure of the uh, demography uh, of the people, the size of uh, families and so forth. So now uh, I think uh, beside uh, PLI, uh, the, uh, we think that uh, we need also to have other indicators where we can put together so we can put uh, look at the more uh, broaden and take into account uh, on the uh, various uh, uh, requirement. So at the moment, uh, we work with uh, several agencies with the, all the stakeholders to look at how we can come up with the 
what we call the cost uh, of living uh, for every uh, key uh, capital state in, uh, in this country. So it is something that uh, we are uh, going to uh, release soon so we can see how, because a PLI is not uh, take into account uh, financial commitment, uh, loan, and also uh, to, uh, to have the minimum uh, asset like, uh, like a house. So it's not uh, 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 totally, totally take into account in the PLI. So of course, uh, uh, a lot of uh, thing also need to be uh, look into it, how the uh, key uh, public service eh, uh, like uh, health facilities, education facility, we so have to look into account. Uh, and if we look at the uh, this uh, uh, census, eh, it's now uh, we are at the final um, uh, stage of the phase one. Hope everyone <laughs> has already exercised uh, uh, your right to fill up the form. So among the question we put in this uh, uh, census is how uh, you commute from your home to your office. So you uh, is it require a very long journey. So when you travel that long, maybe you need to more uh, spend more on petrol and so forth. I mean, uh, if we uh, if we have if anyone get the got the opportunity to scrutinize the. Uh, the the questionnaire the the the, amount, the, the, the focus of this uh, current uh, sensor is on the well-being so we want to really look at the what the uh, thing that we can improve uh, to to look at the welfare of the people uh, in the city and also in the rural area so we can narrow the the, the gap so uh, a lot more and uh, finally i want also uh, to put uh, uh, that uh, for us to moving uh, as the sustainable uh, ni, uh, society, we need the society that can know uh, what happening around us. So we know that in the society, we have uh, people that are very successful, not uh, really successful, and uh, maybe some of are un unfortunate. So the, the, the issue how. Uh, the people that uh, civil society that are successful can come forward uh, to assist and to do something uh, to uh, mitigate. Eh? Uh, not necessary everything have to be come from the government. So the important is how we can empower people through statistics. So we want to have a very uh, 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 as many as possible the statistics at the small area, so people can know uh, exactly what happening in terms of the issue on the social, on the economy, and also at the demography. For example, I will be ready uh, to be uh, have the very good facility for the uh, people at the older age, for example. It is something that uh, we have to look into it, and also how uh, uh, the information uh, can be uh, assessed easily and can be translated uh, uh, for the action. So, uh, one of the uh, characteristics uh, to be a uh, uh, developed country, the people participation uh, in the public policy is very, uh, very huge. If you look at the consumer, in developed country, the consumerism is really uh, powerful. Then the, the producer, uh, the I mean, uh, the service provider uh, cannot simply just uh, dedicate, uh, dedicate the, the price. Uh, the, 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 the consumerism, the, the society at large can uh, determine uh, certain certain uh, uh, po uh, policy and also can again some of uh, action that uh, taken by the uh, business. For example, I'm not sure when uh, that uh, we can really can uh, manage, uh, control the, uh, the culture of overeating. Uh, so now, Malaysia, I think the among the only, perhaps, not many countries that the food uh, is available 24-7. <laughs> if we uh, look at the developed country, uh, uh, after <laughs> evening time, no food, except for the selected uh, places. But in this country, everywhere, is something also can uh, also uh, influence 
the well-being of the uh, the people, especially in the in the city. Oh, I think I stop that. I can continue. <laughs> Many things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jose. Uh, I I believe uh, Dawson has uh, calculated uh, the decent standard of living. Um, the budget will provide the worker with efficient income to reach uh, a decent standard living based on the cost of accommodation, uh, goods and services with the particular uh, locality. And I believe everyone here has filled your e-census. <laughs> <laughs> it is very important eh, to, to fill the e-census. Okay, uh, now is we reach 10, 12. I think I need to take a question from the audience in the auditorium. Is any question from uh, the audience here? Or any question from our online virtual audience? Yes, yes, sir. Introduce your name. Hi, uh, my name is Muhammad Iqbal bin Muhammad Tajuddin, and I'm from Adab Yus Garage, AYG. Can I speak in Malay? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, uh, soalan saya, tak, saya nak tanya uh, pendapat kepada panel-panel lah. Uh, sekarang ni banyak saya akui terlalu banyak event-event ataupun program-program yang membincangkan mengenai kemiskinan bandar. Tapi uh, yang saya nampak tempat yang dibincangkan tu adalah di hotel-hotel mewah dan juga di uh, tempat yang eksklusif lah dan tak melibatkan golongan-golongan sasaran. Adakah mustahil ataupun tidak kalau kita ubah norma ini dan kita buatkan kumpulan perbincangan ni di tempat yang uh, kumpulan sasaran seperti PPR ataupun kampung orang asli ke di tempat yang kita bincangkan pasal kemiskinan itulah. Adakah mustahil atau tidak untuk kita lakukan benda tu? Itu saja. Jadi uh, antara Dr. Suraya and uh, Dr. Sri Uzi want to say something about this discussion on urban poverty, especially the uh, right target groups. Lah. Terima kasih. Uh, uh, kalau kita lihat uh, bagaimana kita nak uh, melihat isu yang kita bincang ni melibatkan uh, isu uh, rakyat, eh, isu masyarakat. Tetapi dalam uh, kita nak mengatasi isu dan permasalahan ni, dia ada Uh, beberapa layer ataupun dia beberapa kategori lah. Jadi yang uh, misalnya di, perang, di kalangan uh, uh, tingkat uh, perancangan di peringkat uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, dia ada kumpulan-kumpulan uh, yang membicarakan, melihat yang memerlukan kadang-kadang perbincangan uh, tersebut uh, perlu dilaksanakan uh, berperingkat-peringkat. Contohnya apa yang kita lakukan di sini, kita berada di sini contohnya untuk kita memanfaatkan Uh, kemudahan teknologi dan sebagainya memerlukan kita berhimpun dalam suasana yang agak uh, comfort uh, untuk me melahirkan perbincangan yang uh, dari segi konektiviti uh, yang boleh mengikuti secara virtual uh, and uh, reaching uh, di peringkat uh, layer yang uh, agak uh, mempunyai uh, background uh, dari segi teoretikal dan juga empirikalnya berbincang uh, di peringkat Uh, kumpulan sasaran tertentu Manakala di peringkat uh, uh, Yang seterusnya Dan sedang berlaku juga Berbincang dengan pihak-pihak ataupun Keterlibatan di kalangan Yang mengalami permasalahan tersebut ya, Seperti yang di kawasan-kawasan Yang berada di tempat-tempat Orang-orang -tempat, uh, uh, miskin dan sebagainya Dan saya uh, mempunyai pengalaman bila kita mengaturkan hari sambutan hari statistik negara tidak di peringkat lembah kelang kita uh, laksanakan di luar bandar misalnya kita nak melihat misalnya uh, tahun lepas kita laksanakan di sebelah selatan di di muar jadi kita melibatkan rakyat semua dan dia punya impak tu saya dapati memang berkesan 
dia melihat tentang betapa statistik eh, uh, amat rapat dengan kehidupan bagaimana keputusan dan juga tindakan yang dibuat itu uh, boleh uh, dihasilkan dengan yang terbaik bila semua melihat statistik itu adalah perkara yang macam mana kita menggunakan air dan uh, elektrik jadi kefahaman itu dapat uh, uh, sampai jelas jadi kemungkinan uh, pelibatan dalam grup-grup yang uh, yang dinyatakan tadi uh, di kawasan-kawasan yang uh, orang asli di kawasan-kawasan luar bandar dan sebagainya ini antara pendekatan yang memang uh, sedang dan akan uh, terus dilakukan lah. dan ia memerlukan uh, perbincangan ataupun uh, diskusi yang bukan berbentuk one off tetapi berbentuk uh, berterusan lah. uh, saya yakin uh, di, di pihak teknokrat, di pihak Uh, penganjur uh, run program ni juga perlu juga mengambil uh, juga pandangan yang dinyatakan tadi dan mungkin akan lebih lebih meluas. Bahkan saya dapati di pengkat kita juga tanpa kita war-war juga sebenarnya kita juga sentiasa menjejaki uh, bersama-sama dengan NGO uh, untuk melihat uh, kadang-kadang ramai uh, misalnya yang berada di uh, kehidupan dalam keadaan gelandangan kan dan kita uh, tahu di mana mereka berada dan sebenarnya bila kita lihat isu-isu yang dihadapi itu uh, kadang-kadang uh, lebih kurang uh, uh, lebih kurang sama lah dia punya uh, isu-isu uh, masalah yang dihadapi ada kaitan dengan uh, uh, latar belakang keluarga dan juga circumstances yang yang berlaku dan saya yakin uh, uh, tidak ada uh, satu perkara yang uh, kita panggil eksklusif lah dalam kita uh, membincang dan juga menyelesaikan uh, apa juga uh, yang Uh, perlu kita lakukan dan dalam era kita interconnected information yang paling penting kan dalam kehidupan kita kita kena aware bahawa uh, kita hidup dalam era yang uh, maklumat uh, di sekeliling kita jadi uh, kita kena bagi peluang lah, ruang dan peluang participation yang uh, sebesar mungkin lah. jadi mungkin uh, saya jangka di peringkat uh, kumpulan-kumpulan tertentu dia ada uh, perwakilan-perwakilannya dan dia akan di, diangkat ke peringkat yang lebih lebih tinggi dalam bentuk uh, yang lebih konkret yang bentuk dalam bentuk empirical dan bentuk uh, uh, kertas-kertas kerja. Jadi saya ingat itu saya punya uh, pandangan lah. Tadi uh, perkhidmatan uh, kerajaan yang berbentuk uh, uh, people centric uh, yang ber, ber, berbentuk uh, memasyarakatkan perkhidmatan uh, dan juga tidak berbentuk frustrated lah. Kita hanya berada di sini bagi saya Uh, kita perlu facilitate uh, kita bukan uh, frustrated kita jadi sistem uh, uh, pengumpulan maklumat misalnya uh, kita ada sistem database eh, yang menjejaki uh, tentang uh, bilangan orang yang uh, dikategori sebagai miskin eh, sedang kita buat pemutihan sekarang uh, bersama uh, agensi-agensi yang berkaitan untuk kita dapatkan satu database yang, yang, yang boleh digunakan sebagai rujukan untuk semua sekarang ni banyak yang berlaku kadang-kadang Uh, ada yang mendapat bantuan uh, dapat uh, beberapa bantuan ada yang tidak dapat kadang-kadang tidak menerima sebab uh, satu rujukan yang komplit uh, uh, tidak tidak dihasilkan ini sedang uh, dilaksanakan dan diharapkan uh, sebenarnya dari segi keupayaan kita nak membantu kita ada banyak uh, platform ataupun uh, keupayaan bahkan kita ada uh, isu-isu misalnya isu zakat isu-isu Uh, kebajikan dan sebagainya yang boleh kita gembling uh, secara uh, bersama-sama. Jadi perkara ini uh, saya ingat uh, saya amat alu-alukan uh, pertanyaan yang ditanyakan tadi dan mungkin kita pun mungkin lepas ni mungkin kita boleh buat sesi yang lain. Contohnya baru ni saya juga buat uh, uh, diskusi bersama komuniti. Uh, turun uh, ke gelanggang, dapatkan feedback dan maklumat dan memang uh, banyak uh, yang uh, dikemukakan bila dalam sesi uh, pandangan dan juga soal jawab itu banyak input-input yang yang uh, boleh uh, kita terima yang kita boleh boleh eh, tambah baik mungkin Mr Reza want to say something how how you communicate with the community I mean like uh, if you read the urban agenda and then you go to the next document which is Afinwa action framework or implementation of new urban agenda, urban agenda. inside there the other all the there is already a framework of how we do things and that's quite eminent Uh, local Agenda 21 has been around for the last 20 years. Some PPT has a practice about 18 years. Some PPT has a practice about 12 years. There's a lot of initiative have been done. I personally uh, engage with uh, Majlis 
doing the local agenda framework, especially with DBKL with the community engagement. There's a lot of things that they already tackle itself uh, in the community in terms of places, uh, in terms of uh, uh, having discussions with the uh, uh, the people in the in KL. Many initiative, too many, uh, from the technology, computer lah, uh, urban farming lah, and also uh, with uh, uh, MBPJ doing a lot of grants, awards, these things. Uh, I mean, for the that's another way of discussion where they actually can apply. I've seen uh, local government give giving a good uh, sharing models of grants for 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 the penduduk uh, desa mentari, and they actually come up with proposals doing craft to uplift their standards, and then uh, also uh, some of the youth doing urban farming at the back side of the house. They don't even ask for the grant money. They finish everything. They give their own money to do the the project first. Then only they. Request for the girl. That's amazing, you know. It's quite eminent that a lot of the NGOs perform, especially social enterprise, perform during the COVID lockdown. And even the PM said that during the lockdown, a lot of SE and uh, NGO came. I was with a policeman yesterday, breakfast. They were talking about his kids got COVID-19 and how he, he had to be, cannot go out to work, but he was in the in house taking care of his family. But, you know, uh, he was talking about how a lot of NGOs actually come and actually help the police to give food because they are working 24 hours in the, the ministry. So uh, this is actually our secret, uh, Malaysian secret, where our NGOs are quite strong, but given the chance of platform that is connected, centralized together, we can actually do more than what we can. So I hope that in the future, uh, there's already a, a lot of initiative, but if the government can actually look at uh, how to uh, consolidate everything. I was at Imran Khan's office last year in Pakistan. S went to uh, Empat. Fourth, fifth floor is Imran's office. Fourth floor Imran's house, uh, the resilient department. Went there inside, saw all the plans. I saw all the NGO mappings. If there's issue, this NGO will take care of this place. That's amazing experience. I hope that the government will can actually consolidate everything and put it to our full strength for Malaysia. Can I just okay. add to... Okay, please. Can we, any question from online, virtual? I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Moderator. Can I just add to his question? Yes, please? yes. Please. Um, I just want to address your question. Um, I'll be doing it in English, if you don't mind. So when I think NGOs, like Mr. Rida said, act as a strategic ally to the government. And how I see it is because, like you said, um, do they have a say? Do they have a voice in these meetings? They do. Um, one of the initiatives that and, um, Dignity for Children's Welfare Department does is we do community profiling. So we sit down with the B40 communities, we talk to them, ask them about their needs, their limitations, their, what are their strengths in the community. And the hope is actually to act as a voice for them to the different stakeholders. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Rebecca. Any question online? Yeah, Dr. Riza. Uh, there's Mr. a Please. online question from Joshua Chow. So the question is, so far, what is the impact from the program conducted so far to the poverty groups, especially in urban setting? And what are the challenges this? Uh, this is a question for all the members of the floor. Nathalie, you want to say something? Question, the question was, what has been the impact so far from... Yeah. For, to the poverty groups, and especially in urban setting. Mm -hmm. And what are the challenges faced? Okay, it's quite a big question, because obviously, I mean, poverty, there's like I mentioned earlier, there's so many aspects, right? There's the education aspect, there's the health aspect, and no one NGO or no one <laughs> department can tackle everything. So I think that, um, like what you mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of parties coming alongside to, to work. And, and we do see a growth in NGOs. I, I Honestly, there's so many NGOs in, in KL that are working towards urban poverty issue. But is it increasing? It's still increasing because you know people will come here for jobs. So in that sense, we will still see urban poverty on the rise unless we have some sort of, you know, like um, that we, we need more uh, a comprehensive uh, and continued work on, on to address the different issues of, of, of urban poverty. Yeah, so I, it's, it's still on the rise, if that's, yeah. 
can I can I answer yes, on the the basis of of shelter? Um, I think from the 1970s onwards, um, one of the ways to eradicate poverty or squatter settlement is to put them in low cost public housing or PPR. I think it's a failure, a huge failure. We are creating vertical slums. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suraya. Can one more question okay, from the Rizal. Facebook okay. Live. We have uh, from Lily Fu. The question is, we have heard excellent presentation on eradicating poverty from the speakers from Dignity for Children. How do you address poverty among the poor elderly, especially the homeless on the streets? So um, the welfare department, we most of the ch the cases that come to us are because the families come to us in aid of the education for the children. So they'll come to us because they need scholarships. Um, so we have five red flags that we pick up to identify and help us narrow down the people who will receive welfare aid. We call them the genuinely needy group. Um, and one of the criteria is if they have a disabled family member and if they have um, parents who are not able to work because they are elderly or sudden unemployment or sudden medical impediment. So from Dignity's point of view, one of the aids that we do is we connect them, we act as a liaison to connect them with the existing welfare agencies. And we do have uh, funding from private sector, some CSR groups, and we have a medical budget. So we allocate that budget for their medical treatment. Uh, we conduct the medical due diligence. We, we, we go down to the hospitals. We discuss with the doctors. We see if their case is genuine. We find the medical justification. And then we channel the funds to help them. However, we, we, our mandate is for children, <laughs> so we work with individuals at 19 and below. That's our primary, um, our primary mandate. So um, in that sense, elderly and homeless fall outside of that scope, though we, we do deal with the families, and the, like you mentioned, the members of the families who do fall in that category. If that impacts the child, it's in our best interest to make sure the child is well cared for, their family is cared for, so then we can carry out the job that we, we, we want to do. Okay, I think... Uh, Ken, you want to say something before we end of this session? Uh, no, no, thank you. It's uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, and it's it's been a pleasure. I've I've not nothing to add to it. To, but thanks. Thank you, Ken. Now we are ten twenty nine. Actually, we have another session, high level dialogue two. We talk about leadership and governing on localizing SDG. So I'd like to thank everyone here for sharing uh, with us your, your initiative, your project, and your research, and Dr. Jose for for amazing job for your upcoming, now ongoing e-census. We have a good, good data, and then um, how we de define our decent uh, standards of living and Dr. Sraya for your research on uh, pov poverty and uh, dignity groups for your amazing jobs for uh, refugees, for dear children, for the urban poverty. Keep going. Don't stop. Reda also, thank you for uplift uh, well-being for youth. And I, I think I give this session back to um, uh, Leah for our next session. Thank you, Dr. Azmizam. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Uze, and all the panelists for today. It's a very great sharing um, for everyone out there. Thank you. photographers to take a photo with all the panelists today.
Ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to the next session.